ഗുഡ് ഈവനിങ് മാറ്റനി ഫെബിനാറേക്ക് എല്ലാവർക്കും ഒരിക്കൽ കൂടി സ്വാഗതം ഇന്ന് വളരെ സവിശേഷതയുള്ള ഒരു ടെക്നിക്കൽ പ്രോബ്ലം ആണ് പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് നമ്മളുടെ ഇന്റർനെറ്റ് സേവനങ്ങളെല്ലാം തന്നെ അണ്ടർ വാട്ടർ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ അണ്ടർ സി ഒപ്റ്റിക്കൽ കേബിൾ നെറ്റ്വർക്കിലൂടെയാണ് നടക്കുന്നത് അപ്പൊ അതിന്റെ സെക്യൂരിറ്റി അല്ലെങ്കിൽ എന്താണ് അതിന്റെ എത്രമാത്രം അത് സെക്യൂർ ആണ് എന്തൊക്കെയാണ് അതിനകത്ത് പ്രധാനമായിട്ടും ഉണ്ടാകാവുന്ന അസാഡ്സ് ഇതിനെ കുറിച്ചൊക്കെ നമ്മളോട് സംസാരിക്കുന്നത് വൈസ് അഡ്മിറൽ കണൻ സാറാണ് സാർ വളരെയധികം ക്രിയേറ്റീവായ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ കൂടുതൽ ഇൻഫർമേറ്റീവായ ഒത്തിരി ടോക്കുകൾ നമ്മുടെ പ്ലാറ്റ്ഫോമിൽ തന്നെ എടുക്കുന്നു മറ്റു പ്ലാറ്റ്ഫോമുകളിൽ എടുക്കുന്നുണ്ട് സോ നിങ്ങളുടെ എല്ലാവരുടെയും പേരില് വളരെ ഹർദ്ദവുമായി കണൻ സാറിനെ ഞാൻ വീഡിയോ ക്ഷണിക്കുകയാണ് കണൻ സാർ യു ആർ വെൽക്കം for giving me one more opportunity to speak to you uh, on a very important topic which has got uh, an impact on our, the quality of life which we we are leading today we are living in a digital world and uh, our communication entertainment healthcare travel education to certain extent governance banking services are all dependent on availability of internet now undoubtedly avail if internet is available it enriches our life there's no doubt about it so it should be our effort to ensure that uh, we have uninterrupted access to internet wherever we are whether we are in the city or in the state somewhere or within our country then it makes a huge positive impact on our uh, quality of life we need to ensure uh, our internet uh, services are intact and the cables which supply this services are uh, safeguarded from any uh, damage our domestic connectivity is largely based on land run cables cables which are laid on our streets on our roads on our countryside you may have seen so many places where cables are being laid and the domestic network is largely based on land based cables while our international connectivity is based on naturally undersea cables which leave from our coastal uh, towns and cities these cables lie on the sea bed unguarded of course they are unguarded and once they are laid they lie there but their health is always monitored by the control station to which it is connected there are methods technologies available by which you can monitor the health of the cable and does not suffer any damage it is possible for the network controllers to keep a close eye a uh, keep close watch on their health but that doesn't reduce their vulnerability the vulnerability of the cables is still there it can be damaged by an inadvertent manner due to some negligent fishing being done uh, natural disasters can cause the damage to cables they can be even due to attack by sea life there have been some reports where sharks have bitten the cables and caused damage or it can be even a malicious action by uh, some uh, some forces which want to cause disruption so you have vulnerability either due to some inadvertent action or it can be even malicious action now at this point of time i want to uh, take your attention to what happened in september 22 during the ongoing russia ukraine war many of you may remember that the gas pipeline which is coming from russia to europe through the baltic sea was completely destroyed by some saboteurs which led to disruption of 
gas supply to Europe. Russia could not sell the gas. Europe could not buy the gas. And they had to buy from somewhere else. International prices went up. And it affected all countries, including India. Similar to uh, natural gas pipeline, which is run under the sea, our internet cables are also lying under the sea. There are power supply cables lying under the sea, uh, which are running from one country to another. Uh, there are some electrical engineers here, so I would say that most of them are uh, DC supply, not AC supply. And uh, soon you will have many cables running from offshore uh, windmills uh, to our coastal line, because we are planning to set up offshore wind farms. So you'll have those power cables also coming from windmills to our receiving station. So there has to be a method by which these are uh, safeguarded, uh, not only from the security point of view, but also from the point of uh, uh, any legal cover in case a damage has been done intentionally by someone. We're going to talk about all these issues today. Uh, for the benefit of uh, uh, viewers who want to watch subsequently also, uh, I have put in three parts. First is India's domestic connectivity. Second is a little bit detail about the cables which are laid under the sea. And lastly, about international connectivity of cables. So with this, I would like to... Uh, share my presentation with you. Uh, am I okay, uh, Sabu? You can see now. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Sure. sure, sure. Okay. I'm only seeing you. Uh, I don't think I am there in the video. Um, so what we'll do? So you can uh, change the view, sir. Change Sorry. the right, change the view from the right side. Can you change it? Uh, I don't have to do sharing in the mighty the view on the mighty. Uh, so right. all right. As long as you make sure it is uh, done properly, it's okay by me. Okay, it's working, no problem. We can talk. Right. So uh, that's my presentation. Uh, how secure are the India's undersea cables? Now I'm showing a graph on the left, which shows that number of internet users in India. In 2023, it's 93 crores and is expected to go up further. Uh, by 2040, it is expected that almost the entire population will have uh, access to internet. That's why it's, the graph is plateauing there. So, there's 93 internet users. Now, most of them are on broadband coaxial cable or fiber optic cable. Some people have only broadband coaxial cable. Uh, some others have fiber optic cable, which means their uh, uh, performance will be much better. There are many people who are using internet only through mobiles and not through uh, landlines. So out of India's 120 crore mobile users, 60 crores have got about smartphones and they also have access to the internet wherever they are. Apart from they having a cable in their residence or an office. And you know, internet provides all these services which I talked about earlier. In India, internet services are provided by your mobile servers, uh, be it uh, Geo or uh, Airtel, or it can be VI. It can also be provided by BSNL, Railnet, and so many other uh, companies which I have listed there. So let's go to the part one of domestic internet connectivity. I'm showing you three network maps. One is of Tata's, one is of Railtel, and one is of Reliance Geo. Unfortunately, I am not able to lay during my research on any map which gives the entire fiber optic network which is laid in the country. It is given as per the 
persons who are owning the cables, like in case of Jio or Tata's or railways. But the Department of Telecommunication says 34 lakh kilometers of cables have been laid in India, uh, both India, both urban as well as rural. So there is a large amount of connectivity which has been provided by fiber optic cables which are laid on our land. So I just want to take a little time to tell you how you get connected. Assume you're at a home, either on your mobile or on your laptop, wherever you are, and you want to access your mail. Let's say your mail is Gmail. So I'm taking two examples. You are on your mobile or laptop and you want to access your mail. So what happens? When you go to your mail application, your mobile or laptop, whoever is providing that service to you, will connect you to an internet service provider, which is the blue color. I've written tier three here. He is the person who gives the internet connection in your city. So there is a specific person who connects the, all the internet users in a particular region. I'm taking your city or town as the place. Thereafter, that person gets connected to the tier two and he gives a statewide coverage. Then it goes to tier one, which may be given a zonal coverage, let's say South Zone. And you, you still not reach Gmail, huh? you're still away from Gmail. You only crossed tier one, two, three. And Gmail server in India is only in two places. One, in Bombay and one in Noida. So if you are from South India, it is your account, your inbox, etc., is likely to be with the Bombay server. And if you're from North, it's likely to be Noida server. So it doesn't matter where you are, it will go to that particular server and get your inbox. But for this example, I'm saying now, the tier one person will connect you to the internet Gmail, I'm sorry, the Gmail server. All this happens in one or two seconds, even less than that. I will show you a screenshot how I've been connected to Google uh, through seven ISPs. Seven, ten, one, two, three, four, five, seven. And all this has happened in less than 60 milliseconds. So I just want to tell you, you're happy that you've got your internet connection, but your request to access your mail goes through seven networks, which are computed, uh, computer controlled, and you get your Gmail uh, mail for the day, you are able to see it. And thereafter you take whatever actions required. So this similar route is also followed for any other addressee. Suppose you want to go to a website of Reliance Industries, who has got uh, a particular server, then it follows a route. So this route is decided by the topology uh, of the various addresses. I'm just using a word for those who are not familiar with topology. And this is, uh, the ISPs know where the addresses and which route they should take. Now, I want to share with you, why is this important? You often read in the paper, that the internet will be switched off in Kannur district. How does it happen? The tier three of Kannur is told switch off your server. And therefore, anyone who's within that area is not able to get connected to the internet. If you say whole state internet should be done, like it has happened in uh, Jammu and Kashmir so many times, the tier two, is asked to switch off his uh, servers and therefore no connection get passed through it to internet. It could be for mail, it could be for uh, WhatsApp, it could be for some other uh, genuine requirement of internet uh, for some uh, getting some information, Google information. It is not possible. 
goes through this structured topology, which also helps authorities to disable internet if required. Now, what happened to, we talk about mainland, what happened to our islands in the east and west? Land cables cannot reach there. So let me tell, share with you what is the present status on that. Beyond our land borders to our islands, till 2020, they were linked only through satellite. No sea cable, no undersea cable. In August 2020, a new cable was laid from Chennai to Port Blair and seven islands in Andamans, which was done by BSNL. And thereafter, Andamans have got fairly good access to internet. Well, I have been to Andamans so many times during my naval career. I've always experienced difficulty that you're not able to get WhatsApp message, you're not able to get internet there because it was only through satellite and satellite doesn't give you good connectivity, which I'll touch upon a little later. As far as Lakshadweep is concerned, it is still on satellite, even today, as we speak. A cable is being laid from Kochi to Lakshadweep and it will go to uh, 11 islands of Lakshadweep. It is being laid by a company from Japan called NEC and is expected to be commissioned by October 23. So as far as our islands are concerned, by end of this year, they will have connectivity through undersea. Undersea cables give a larger bandwidth and less latency, or I will say delay, while satellites don't give this much of bandwidth and there's always a latency in satellite link of internet. And capital intensive are cables, are capital intensive, more than the satellite uh, transponders which are required. But in the long run, cables are cheaper. So I have just compared these two. Now, what about countries connected to India by land? Nepal. Nepal is connected by land cable but it's also connected to China. So he gets internet cables from both China and India. Bhutan, connected only to India. China is not connected so far. Bangladesh, Bangladesh is connected to Assam. And here there is a small difference. We are buying internet connective bandwidth from Bangladesh. While in Nepal and Bhutan, we are giving, but for Bangladesh, we are buying because Bangladesh has got excess capacity through undersea cables, which has come to them in their uh, harbor. So they are able to spare some connectivity for India. That's why it's gone to Assam and from there it'll go to Northeast. But to rest of all the countries in the world, if you are sending WhatsApp, if you are sending mail, if you are speaking on uh, WhatsApp, it is only through undersea cables. So all the communication which you are sending to a person outside India, including the islands, outside India, they go through undersea cables, which is what I'm going to talk about in uh, the subsequent one on international connectivity. So uh, very briefly on the undersea cables, some characteristics. There are many cables laid in the world. Uh, presently, it's about 1.3 million kilometers of cables are laid. They are also called in some literature as submarine cable, but it's the same as undersea cable only. And these cables are very ruggedized. Uh, they're very well protected. The fib optical fiber is right in the center, but they've got many layers around them to protect it for the static pressure, because it'll be at depths of many kilometers. Average depth is 3.5 kilometers. There are some up to 10 kilometers, some are less. So they have to also withstand the low temperatures, which is experienced at the bottom of the sea. And also a very harsh marine environment, which can be experienced due to corrosion, etc. There are about 430 cables laid till to date. When I say 430 cables means one cable may start from a city A, it will go to city B via 
many other intermediate cities en route. So normally cables are called from, let us say, from Singapore to London. It may go to many other uh, uh, coastal towns and cities, including of India's, some 10, 15 places, but the cables are known from their starting point and end point. Like there are, there are 430 cables laid and they carry 99% of the international data today. So if these cables are uh, disrupted, there'll be impact on uh, data communication between uh, that part of uh, the world with others. As I told you, they're very reliable by construction. They're self-healing by design. Uh, um, there are some engineers in this group. So let me tell them what I mean by self-healing. Uh, what, what I mean is the mostly this digital communication only, not analog. And this digital communication does suffer from a little bit of uh, uh, attenuation, uh, does suffer some distortion also. So what happens is uh, they are retransmitted. They got laser transmitters inside the cable. So every 100 kilometers, roughly, this data is read and a fresh set of data from a new laser is put out on the fiber optic cable. So that is what it's called uh, self-healing by design, high data capacity, and it can be branched off to increase flexibility. You have a main cable going, let us say, from Singapore to London, but you can have a branch going away to Karachi or branch going away to some other uh, city. So it's possible to do that. There's only one continent not connected by undersea cable. Only one. That is Antarctica. Uh, you may know Antarctica does not belong to any country. Uh, it's only a region. And in Antarctica, there are no undersea cables, primarily because the temperature is minus 80 degrees in some places. And second, there are shifting ice formations, which put strain on the cables and make it difficult uh, to establish uh, reliable connectivity. Cables are often snap because of this. So I give you a very brief just on undersea cables, uh, how, what is the distance and what is the number of cables run. So this is how it looks. Uh, there's a cable station on the, uh, on the beach or somewhere near the beach. And from there, the cable goes along. And these are the transmitters, which I told you. They're also called optical amplifiers along the route. And every 100 kilometers is roughly the uh, gap between uh, two amplifiers. The laying is done by specialized ships. The land, the end of cables are thicker. Why? Because the, the land end of cables, first of all, they are uh, uh, prone to negligent uh, accidents, which can be caused by fishing gear. That is one part. Therefore, they need to be armored more. Second, they need to take the weight of the cable till it reaches the seabed. The weight comes on the cable, which is called the catenary. So to make sure that uh, these two factors are addressed. The land end cables are uh, thicker, while the sea end is thinner, uh, 25 mm cables, and they're usually buried in the seabed. A, a, a small trench is made by the ship which is laying, and then the cable is put inside that so that uh, they don't get easily uh, get trawled by some other uh, mechanical gear which is operating there. The cables are terminated on the land, and this is called a cable landing station, where all the fiber optic cables are, uh, fiber optic cores, I'm sorry, are connected to equipment uh, in the cable landing station. And they are able to monitor the health also through that. And as I told you, every 100 kilometers, there's an optical amplifier, which can be sometimes less than 100 or more than 100, but average is around 100. Now, this is how the cable looks internally, just for information. Land-based cables look like this, with the fiber optic core uh, in the center, with some protection cladding and plastic coating and et cetera. While the shore end of the undersea cable has got many layers, 
including a huge armor layer to make sure that I told you uh, they have to withstand uh, much more rigor. While the sea end is similar to land end, but much smaller in tire and not so many layers of protection. Now, who are the people who manufacture this cable? Just for information, I'm sure some of you may be knowing it already. There's a US company uh, which, uh, which has uh, been uh, in this business for quite some time. And they have supplied almost 0.68 million kilometers so far. Uh, Francis Alcatel has supplied 0.33. Japan's NEC, who's linked the cables to Lakshadweep, is laid, uh, manufactured 0.3 and supplied. These three companies put together, they cater for 90% of the 1.3 million so far laid. I told you, 1.3 million kilometers have been laid. So they, these are the three main suppliers. Off late, China's company, Huawei Marine Networks, have recently entered market and they supplied a very small quantity. But they are uh, catching up on this front. And um, soon you'll find they are able to supply more cables. India has no manufacturing capability as far as these cables are concerned. We don't manufacture. Uh, we are dependent on uh, whatever cables in case we want to buy a cable and lay it. So when you want to lay a cable to, when BSNL wants to lay a cable from Chennai to Andamans, they bought the cable from some company. As I told you, the NEC is laying the cable to Lakshadweep. So let's look at the cable laying very briefly, undertaken by specialized ships. You can see the photograph how the cables are lifted and uh, lowered into the sea. The ship has got a moon pool in the center. That means it is open to sea in the center. The center of the ship, there's a small little opening through which this cable goes into the sea so that this cable is very clear of its propeller, which is at the back end. Uh, this navigation of these ships are done by GPS because the cables had to be laid perfectly straight without any bends. There are special equipment for making the trench. As I told you earlier, when one reel finishes, uh, it is spliced. Most of you have seen splicing of cables on the land. Similar to that, splicing is done on the sea, but on the deck of the ship with the next reel, and then the laying continues. A ship normally carries cable about 2,000 kilometers, but it lays about 100 kilometers a day. In 20 days, it will finish that mission and wait for the next ship to come with the set of cables. The shortest cable laid in the world is between UK and Ireland, 130 kilometers plus. While the largest cable which is laid is from Japan to UK, 39,000 kilometers. Of course, going any, via many countries. It is not one cable of 39,000 kilometers. From Japan, it will come to some place. Then another cable starts from there. So total uh, cable is around 39,000 kilometers. So I'm showing you a photograph of a building. I don't know whether you're able to read the board, but this is the cable landing station of Chennai, uh, where uh, the cable from Andamans has landed. A very simple building it looks, but internally I'm sure there are many equipment. The operations are controlled from uh, this cable landing station, and they provide the DC supply for the optical amplifiers. They work on DC supply, which is also going along with the uh, fiber optic cable through other cores. They have the landing station equipment to take care of the health of the cable and report. Uh, it's very easy to know where exactly is the damage. If there are damages caused by, as I told you, natural uh, disasters or uh, uh, fishing vessels uh, or malicious action by some countries or by some divers, uh, you know exactly where's the damage because you're able, through the fiber optics, you're able to find out uh, when it is getting reflected back and you will know it's about 200 kilometers or 500 kilometers away from your coast is the damage and the ship can be asked to go there and investigate. But obviously, uh, for a ship to go 500 kilometers or reach that place will take some time. So any damage will take a few couple of weeks will happen. And on an average, about 100 defects are reported uh, in a year, but mostly due to uh, on the shore and side due to some uh, fishing activity. And uh, 
they're all repaired uh, by special ships. Now let us look at India's international internet connectivity. Can you see the number of cables around India? Huge number of cables going around India. Some are coming from east, some are coming from west. India has a unique status in this. First thing is, India has a billion internet users, nearly a billion. Uh, I said 93 crores. I'm sure it will touch 100 crores soon and become a billion. It's a huge market for digital data traffic. So people want to run cables, companies want to run cables to India because they can access this market of 1 billion users. Second, India's geography in Indian Ocean offers very cost-effective solution for cable landing stations. As I told you, So, the supply and the rich on the top of the area of the ATM. Uh, meantime, and then give uh, underwater sea and all experience on the gill of the param. Play marine drive like a chandelier, uh, cable repair in the ship will go. Cable ship in the white color. I give you up. There is some uh, Arbodolum cable ship. Logo Mudanite under India than a Padineda Padineda submarine cable networks on the Saranakuch and the Parliament. There is a Sopana and ATM, Sarpatana rejoined. Coimbatur line on a weather. Ah, Coimbatur have a power supply problem on the Nadi Parish. change over one into the Time. Able to hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. So can I go back to my uh, presentation? Uh, you want you want to share one second? I, I have to share once more. Yes, sure. I was expecting this will any time. Okay. So I'm sharing it. Yes, yes. It's coming. Are you able to see? Uh, no, sir. You have to select the PowerPoint. I, I selected the PowerPoint. Once again, I'll do. Okay. No, no. It's not coming. Ah, yes. It's okay. Okay. So uh, I was talking about uh, India's unique status, uh, India's unique status, and uh, we we touched upon that aspect uh, that India has uh, Indian geography offers good solution for uh, cable layers and cable manufacturer cable uh, service providers to lay cable via India. The third point is India's seven and a half percent of GDP is from software exports. We are the fifth largest economy in the world now. And for this, you require assured digital connectivity, especially in software exports, because a lot of your clients are abroad 
and you are in India, the developers are in India, some are in India, some are abroad. So they need to have very well assured digital connectivity. So that is an important factor. And the last factor is India has a marine domain awareness system. That means every ship uh, which is in Bay of Bengal, as well as in Arabian Sea and some parts of Indian Ocean are tracked by uh, through satellites, uh, through some special equipment. So we are aware of all the ships which are operating here. And uh, therefore we will know uh, that if an unidentified ship is there, then we will be able to investigate quickly. And therefore, uh, chances of any intruder into this area is, uh, is minimized. I'm not saying it is 100% uh, uh, risk-free, but it is fairly, uh, fairly, coverage is very good, accuracy is very good, and we are able to keep track of most of the ships above a particular size, uh, because when from satellite you see there is a limitation of the size as well. So we are able to uh, look at this area very well. And this is a comforting um, factor for people who are investing in undersea cables uh, so that uh, the security provision is uh, taken care of. So I want to ask who owns the cables? Somebody has owned the cables and they put so much money. Cables are not owned by governments. No government is owning any cable anywhere in the world. It's all owned by international consortia or tech giants like Facebook. This is all recent, huh? uh, Google and Facebook, Amazon, they all started laying their own cables because they, they feel laying own cable and using it is cheaper than hiring a bandwidth from other cable uh, providers. So it is usually a group of company because the capital intensive and roughly it costs about uh, $2 million per kilometer. So it costs a whole lot of money. And uh, this can go up to even 6 million, depending upon the route, depth, uh, where how many landings are there, uh, how many shore connectivity is there, et cetera. The Indian industries who are in this sector are Tata's, Reliance Geo, Arcom, uh, which belongs to the brother uh, uh, of uh, Anil Ambani's company, Airtel and BSNL. Of course, BSNL has been doing only our domestic and some regional connectivity, uh, which I will touch upon a little later. Uh, so these are the companies from India, private companies are there. And BSNL is one public sector, which is there for uh, small distance cables, which are in our uh, uh, neighborhood. Now, an important factor. Well, after laying the cable, it may be a 10 core, 10 pair cable, 16 pair cable. They don't use all the pairs initially. That's kept a secret. They may use only four pairs out of 16 available and the remaining 12 are intentionally kept unconnected or not activated because they want to keep the business, the demand supply equilibrium. You should have a demand more than what you can, what you are offering or what you're supplying. To make, take care of this, companies intentionally uh, connect only some of the cores which they have laid and the balance is utilized as and when the business grows. Uh, and this is kept a, a big secret within the, within the business group so that uh, how much spare capacity is available with Tata's or how much is with Geo is, uh, is not available in public uh, domain. So let's look at India's undersea cables from 1997 when it started up to now, how many are there? But I should tell you, India's first undersea cable was in pre-independence time. It is not fiber optic. It was a telegraphic cable from UK. It came via Aden. And during our pre-independence days, people could receive telegram from UK and of course send telegram from India. And that's how uh, Britain had operated 
to many countries uh, in the Asian side. Uh, they had laid cable, including to Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, and so many places. They have laid cables for their telegraphic uh, messages to be sent and replays obtained. Uh, there's no other way of communication. There were no satellites, there were no fiber optics during those days. But fiber optics came in 1997 to India, fiber optic cables. And today we have 17 cables uh, which are landing in India including the one at Chennai from Andamans. I've included that also. So the first cable, Indian cable, you can see the map, was laid uh, from Japan to UK. And it touched Bombay on its journey towards UK. This is about 28,000 kilometers cable. And two pairs of it was owned by Arcom at that point of time. You could buy two pairs out of it. Uh, and then expanded as the business grew in 1997. Today, we have the 17 cables landing in five coastal stations. Mumbai, where maximum number of cables come. Uh, then you have Chennai. Then you have Kochi. And then you have Tutikorin and Trivandrum. Uh, please look at the locations. Um, they are all one in East Coast and one in West Coast at Mumbai, Chennai. But Kochi, Tutikur, and Trivandrum are towards the southern tip of India for the cable to just go around and then get landed there, and then a fresh cable gets uh, laid thereafter. Uh, we have installed capacity of so many uh, terabits, but we activate only 67%. Uh, please remember what I told you earlier. All the cores are not connected till the business grows. And five more cables are going to be laid in the next three years. There's going to be a huge spurt in this activity in India. I'm going to show some of the cables which are being laid or planned to be laid very soon. The first one which I'm talking about is its cable called MIST, which is from Myanmar, Malaysia, India, Singapore, Thailand, which will be ready by end of this year. And it is 8,100 kilometers long with 12 pairs. You see the map. You can see it's coming to Chennai as well as to Mumbai in India. Uh, cost is around 400 million dollars. There are no Indian companies in ownership. It's completely owned by some foreign consortia. Uh, the next one is two sets of cables. Can you see a dotted line? Left of it is one cable, right of it is another cable. One is blue and another is white line. These are owned by Geo. In fact, Geo's first cable was laid in 2017 from France to Hong Kong. But these two cables, which have been laying now, IEX and IEX, uh, India, Europe Ex uh, Express, and India, Asia Express, they are going to be laid by 2024. These cables will uh, hugely enhance the uh, connectivity between India and the West, as well as, uh, as, well as the East. OK. Now, uh, let's go to the third cable. It's called Two Africa uh, by 2024. It is around the uh, African uh, continent, like a necklace, but it has got extended to uh, uh, Middle East and Europe and India, etc. It's 45,000 kilometer long, 16 pair, and landing will be in Bombay, which will be looked after by Airtel. 36% uh, of the world's population is, uh, will be connected when this cable is uh, activated. Cost nearly $1 billion. Uh, uh, this is an interesting uh, cable. It's called Blue Raman. It comes from Italy to India. Blue is from Italy to Israel. And Raman is from Israel to India. Raman is named after C.V. Raman, uh, who is a Nobel laureate. You all are aware of it. It connects uh, other countries as well, Jordan, Saudi Arabia. There is something very special about this particular cable. Okay, it's owned by Google, likely it cost $400 million. So many kilometers long, which are given there. Completion by 24. This is the first cable which does not go through Suez Canal which is full of cables at this point of time, Suez Canal. So uh, this cable comes to Israel and then goes by land 
to Jordan. And from there, it comes to a cable landing station. And then by Red Sea, it comes uh, towards uh, India. So this this the first cable, which is avoided coming through uh, Suez Canal, Google has decided to do this way. Uh, there could be some strategic thinking on that. So these are the new five new cables which are coming to uh, India, which I talked about. And uh, let's go to uh, now India's hub of undersea cables, a quick um, understanding it. By 2025, India will have 22 cables. Today, we are having only 17. And any break in connectivity in any of these cables will cause disruption to economy. Uh, you can well appreciate that. While a failure will take about uh, a week, a few weeks for repair shippers to go there, pull out the cable, cut it, put another piece, splice this and splice that and it takes time, you will have uh, disruption for almost 20 days, 25 days. In 2017, a cable was found cut near Jeddah and 22 near Egypt, which affected India very badly. Who cut this cable is not very clear. It is not put in public domain, but the fact is if there's a damage of the cable, somewhere else upstream, you will find your connectivity is lost and your internet services, unless you have a topology by which you can reroute the cable or reroute your internet through some other cable. Uh, it is possible to do it sometimes, but it is not always possible. So uh, we had these two instances in the last uh, five years. A few cases have come recently, uh, which implicate China. And I will just show you some two examples. There's a cable running from India, from Kochi to South Africa. And this cable is called SAFE, South Africa to Far East. It comes, it, a branch comes to India, as you can see. Uh, node number five is in India. Now, uh, it comes to Mauritius and then goes to Kochi. Now, what happened in 2019, a branch cable was laid by a Chinese company from Port Louis to an island called Bedo Jacolet, which is also in Mauritius. They laid another cable, a branch cable, to the main cable which is running from India to South Africa. Now, this branch cable is suspected to enable China in stealing data, in monitoring Indian data flowing in the cable from Kochi. So, this came to the notice of Indian government. They did some quick uh, technical investigation. Uh, they have taken some uh, corrective action, some administrative action, etc. But the fact is, if you have a branch cable connected to the main cable, it is possible to vacuum clean the data. And you will be able to analyze the data and uh, generate some information out of the data which you have stolen from it. Why this is important is, I don't know how many of you know about this. There is an island called Agalege. There's an island called Agalege, which is of Mauritius, which India has the permission to build an, an airfield for the Indian Air Force and a jetty for Indian naval ships. So India has a foothold in the center of Indian Ocean uh, for its military outreach. Now, this has been uh, under observation by China. And I feel this branch cable which they have connected to the safe cable is to uh, make sure that they're able to steal data of what is flowing uh, through these cable, especially because of India's uh, military outpost is coming in this island called Agalage near uh, Mauritius. The second example, which I'm quoting, you see the map, is between Taiwan and China. Three months back, two of Taiwan's cables were found cut in an island called Matsu. They were severed there, 
and uh, it's in the, within the red circle which I have put there. In that place, it was done in February 23. It is suspected these were done by Chinese trawlers who had special cutting gear which can cut the cable which is lying on the seabed. And this seriously affected uh, the internet connectivity to Taiwan. And you know, uh, China Taiwan uh, relations are restrained. And this could be one of the actions which China has done, perhaps to uh, irritate uh, the US trying to support Taiwan, etc. But the fact is, internet cables got uh, disabled. They are yet to be connected back as per whatever information is available on uh, public domain. So it is possible that a country which has got capability to send a ship and cut your cable can disable your internet cable which is lying on the seabed, which will affect your economy, which will affect the quality of life for the billion users uh, who are using that cable for internet connectivity. So it is an asset which is lying in international water mostly uh, unguarded, there's nobody standing guard there, but it is vulnerable. And therefore we have to find ways and means of by which these cables are uh, safeguarded, one. And if damaged, we should be able to quickly repair it. Number three, we should be able to also find who could have done it and then take it up with that country on with some proof how, why and how they could have launched this malicious action. So vulnerability of cables has to be addressed, not only by India, but all the countries who have, or dip, every country in the world is depending on undersea cables for internet connectivity. So there has to be a global uh, action plan to make sure uh, that cables are safeguarded and cables are, uh, uh, respected by each other so that they, you don't go and destroy somebody else's internet connectivity, even though you may achieve the aim of disabling their economic uh, activity for some time. So let's take this point a little further and see what is going to happen. This is how a cut cable looks like, uh, of one of the cables which got cut. So the vulnerability of cables can be either in digital domain, you can, somebody can connect a cable to it and steal the data, that's one part. Then the cable is not cut. He has made sure it is a branch is connected and taking away the data, or physically cut, which will disable, which will be will have to be repaired. Now the physical damage, as I told you earlier, it can happen due to many reasons, but it can also be due to malicious action by someone. While the digital theft uh, can can happen either by connecting a branch cable or there is something called a backdoor in the cable design. When you design the cable and sell the cable, you provide a backdoor in the cable for taking away a copy of the data to someone else who can connect the cable. So uh, this is actually by the designer, the manufacturer of the cable. And as a buyer, you may not realize that uh, such a facility has been put uh, in, in the cable. It, will, it may be a bug like you have in the software, something similar to that. But the fact is here it's a hardware backdoor which has been provided for you to take away the digital data. So we need to be uh, very clear that uh, cable landing stations where the cables actually land have to be protected. They are high security areas because that's where the cable finally comes and there are huge equipment there which distribute the data to the uh, ISPs, internet service providers, through land uh, fiber optic cables running to different directions to different users. So that has to be protected very well. That apart, we also have to make sure the land end of the cable is adequately uh, strengthened and also safeguarded by frequent uh, uh, monitoring and uh, having a survey as often as possible so that uh, the, cable, the damages are not uh, happening in bits and pieces and then finally it gets fully cut. Okay, so let's go to 
the conclusions of this uh, talk which we had today. Undersea cables are the invisible. It's invisible to you and me. It's lying under the sea. Only when it comes to the cable landing station on your coastal town, it surfaces. Otherwise, it's lying under the sea. It is invisible, but it's vital. It's a vital neural network for the critical information infrastructure of the world. It has to be uh, made sure it is healthy and it is intact. By cooperative action by everyone, we can't afford uh, a rogue state uh, to do some damage to this. India is a major attraction. Today we are 17, we go to 22, but more and more cables will come because uh, they feel India has got a trusted and safe landings for many considerations, we discussed this due to geography, due to economic, as well as security aspects. This I already mentioned, 17 and 22. And they can be uh, suspect, uh, they can be uh, uh, damaged by natural disasters or uh, negligent fishing vessels. It can also happen very soon when we start sea mining. Sea mining has not started in EEZ in any country till to date. It's only research is going on and some demonstration is going on. But it's expected in a couple of years' time, India The power breakout on that in Sir, I power break on our second. Sir, cut I by poor. Sir, sir, uh, because there's heavy rain here in uh, Coimbatore and uh, power failure has been there. Uh, can I go back to my uh, uh, presentation once again? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, I'll just uh, share the screen. Okay, are you able to see me now? Yes, 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 sir. Yes, I'm can. not seeing. Okay. So let's go to the conclusions. We had finished the first three, four bullets. So uh, I was talking about mining. Now, mining, sea mining is going to start uh, by many countries. India is one of them. And that will happen on the East Coast and West Coast. And when uh, you will have uh, uh, some sort of underwater vehicles which will go and pick up uh, polymetallic nodules from the seabed. And uh, while they are going and doing all this work, they may uh, trample upon some cables and they may even uh, cause some damage. So 
if sea mining is not uh, controlled appropriately, then you may have some damages happening, but not now, a couple of years more. But the fact is, undersea cables are vulnerable uh, to various factors, and the number of factors are only increasing. It is not reducing, and there's no solution for providing uh, safeguarding the cables which are lying on the seabed, which is international territory. Uh, it is accessible to anyone. There is no legal cover if somebody cuts a cable. There is no law which says that they have violated a law. Now, this is a serious drawback because uh, unlike ships which are operating in open sea and when they have a collision or when they have violated a law of the sea, then there is a UN convention which comes into play. But that is for a ship which is moving or a ship which is anchored. But something lying on the seabed is not covered by this unless the owner of the cable has a, a domestic law which is linked to the UN Convention, which is not there in India. So many of the people, uh, Indian companies which are owning cables, uh, I don't have this legal backing because our uh, legal system does not cover for uh, an international asset owned by one of our companies uh, and it is damaged for him to be given legal protection. Now this has to come. I'll tell you why this has to come because soon you will have offshore wind farms and they'll be running a cable from the offshore wind farm to the shore uh, power supply station and there also cables will be laid and these cables will be running through uh, maybe through territorial waters and some can be even in international waters the territorial water is up to 12 miles 12 nautical miles and beyond that is international water so it is possible that we are in international water as well because it is within your EZ which is up to 200 nautical miles so you may have a damage to your cable but if you don't have a legal uh, support then uh, you will find that you are not able to claim uh, any, uh, and you're not able to initiate any legal action against a person who has caused it. While insurance company may give you against uh, natural disasters, but against a particular person may be difficult. So uh, with India becoming a dominant digital economy, we need to enhance this part of uh, undersea cables, the security part of it, uh, as I told you, intelligence gathering is an important aspect so that uh, any movement of any uh, seagoing assets which are coming to, which are deployed for any dam, cause any damage, you come to know of it, you should have a contingency plan if it is cut. I told you about rerouting of uh, internet or topology change. Um, let's say Bombay is cut, so you route all the internet from Kochi uh, to the same destination, you should be, have a plan for it. Uh, similarly, if something happens to Ch uh, Chennai, then you, Chennai is only one of the East Coast. Uh, so if it is cut, then you will have to make sure it is routed to Tutikoran and from Tutikoran it goes somewhere else. So the topology has to be uh, done through contingency planning. And as I told you, there has to be a legal framework which doesn't exist today. All these are required in the coming years so that there is an assurance uh, for companies who are investing money in undersea cables uh, of legal protection as well as some security cover. And availability of these cables is absolutely necessary for internet connectivity with which, without which uh, we don't have a good quality of life. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I think I've shared uh, some information about undersea cables to you. Uh, with this, thank you very much and Jai Hind. I'm stopping the sharing. If you have any question answer, I'll answer. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, the session. We have an uninterrupted internet connection on the satellite. We have a lot of people who are in the world. We have a lot of people who are in the world. We have a lot of people who are in the world. We have a lot of people who are in the world. Uh, sir, what are the Katima to the Paranim? 
Thank you very much, sir. Once again, uh, now we have some discussion with. Uh, Sabu, okay. let me answer your question. Yeah. Uh, or your observation. Yeah. 99% of international data goes through undersea cables. Yes. In the land, within India, on land, it is through fiber optic connection. Satellites can also carry, but people don't prefer satellite communication because of uh, bandwidth is less, there's a latency, and also it is expensive. There are uh, people having both, let's say uh, Air Force or the Army, the different services have both. Yes, yes. Uh, fiber optic cables laid on the land of the country, as well as satellite link. They have both. They prefer to use whichever they want because suddenly you find the land, somebody is laying a pipeline somewhere and they cut the cable. You should be able to either change the topology quickly or you should be able to establish uh, a satellite. During my presentation, you saw how internet got failed to my house uh, twice yes. because of power supply failure. It had got nothing to do with cable cut but due to power supply failure. Same thing can happen uh, within our country. Uh, so uh, you have to make sure this is available uh, of the highest uh, level of uh, uh, redundancy as well as uh, uh, assurance and reliability. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay, Srikumar, sir, please. Hello? Yes. Pardon, sir. Like in power cables, do we have this kind of losses in the power cables uh, see undersea cables from losses now one the efficiency undersea cables energy. have only fiber optic cables yeah yeah so and there pre is... pre independence time it was telegraphic cable and they use very high voltage to send uh, telegraphs and since they were using a uh, morse code very slow rate of communication they used to key in the morse code and send this data uh, mm -hmm. they used to get repeated after uh, thousand odd kilometers, again get repeated, again get repeated, like that used to come. That's how we were receiving uh, telegraph during pre-independence days. Uh, but thereafter, after satellites came, uh, then uh, satellites replaced uh, this uh, telegraphic cable for some time. But the fiber optic cable, uh, which uh, which got developed in the world in some time in 19, uh, mid 80s, it got developed, fiber optic cables developed. Then they made a marine version of it by which you could lay the undersea cables. So essentially undersea cables came into uh, things sometime in the end 80s or sometime around 1990. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, anything else, Sri, wanted to know? Yeah. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. I've told you that. Uh, no, I'm calling somebody else. Yeah, there'll, there'll there'll be some losses in the fiber optic cable. We all know that there'll be some distortion yes, and there'll be some attenuation. That is why they repeat the data. They read the data when it is fairly uh, reliable, without much distortion and without much attenuation. They read the data and retransmit using laser under the sea. Every 100 kilometers, this happens. Yes. So while I'm speaking to you on Zoom, my uh, niece who's listening in the kind of uh, US, will, my talk will be going through optical amplifiers which are lying between India and US. Every 100 kilometers. Is there any kind talk. of noise? Uh, just like we're having uh, noise. Uh, there there is a little bit of, um, see, the... Fiber optic uh, technology is very well developed and you have fiber optic uh, cables on the land also. There's no difference between 
yeah. that innovation and uh, uh, distortion between a land fiber optic and a undersea fiber optic. Yes, They're essentially same. Only yeah. thing is the undersea one has to be yes, ruggedized yeah. to withstand the temperature, pressure, as well as uh, uh, the harsh environment. Yes, yes. Anybody else? Okay, okay thank you. Uh, anybody else? Okay, please. Sir. Uh, once these cables are laid, yeah. uh, normally, what will be the life of the cables? So, uh, no, once these cables are laid, uh, what will be the life of these cables? Normally, the possibility of occurring fault is very, very less. Even though, uh, are these cables needed? Any routine maintenance? No, there is no, first of all, these cables, uh, nobody accesses these cables to do any maintenance under the sea. Oh. It is not okay. there. Oh. Many reasons are there for it. One, no man can go to the depths to which these cables are laid. No diver can go. Okay. Because it is more than 500, 600 meters minimum. No diver can go and uh, divers can go only up to some 200 or 300 or 400 meters, depending upon the equipment which they have. So it has to be done through some submersible and there's no requirement for doing any maintenance on these cables. Okay, However, sir. cables, as I told you, are self-healing if there is any, which I told you those optical amplifiers and plus if there's any damage which has happened to the cable or the cable has started becoming non-functional, then you have to send a ship to lift the cable because you know approximately the distance where the fault has happened because the sound will go and get reflected back at the place where there is a damage. So you know it is 550 kilometers from Chennai. So you send a ship, they lift up the cable, they'll cut the cable, and they'll put another cable joining both sides and the damage piece they will just dispose of. This will take 20, 25 days to do. Ship okay. has to go also there and do all this work at sea. So by design, they're very, very reliable. No maintenance required, but maintenance is required only in the cable landing station where a lot of other equipment are there where power supplies are uh, maintained and there are uh, the physical strain of the cable's load while it is coming towards land is uh, taken by special mechanical fixtures which will hold the cable in place before it goes to the electronic equipment inside the cable landing station. Okay. Uh, so briefly, no maintenance, only health monitoring. Okay, sir. Another, sir, uh, another doubt is, at yeah. the time of laying these cables, uh, is there any precautions for keeping away these cables from the damage due to ships? From the? Damage due to ships. The travel of ships. By the, by the ship by which I is laying sorry. it. Oh. Yeah, these are specialized ships. I told you, these ships have got a moon pool. That means there's a small opening in the center of the ship towards the sea. Okay. So from the ship, the center, there's an opening through which the cable is laid into the sea, number one. Number two, the ships are provided with very accurate navigation so that the cables are laid in a perfect straight line. Okay. And no bend happens on the cable while it is laid. The okay. ship is on the surface of the water and cable is three kilometers below, right? Okay. So to make sure that it is laid perfectly in a straight line, the ship does very slow speed and has got special equipment to make sure it is going in a perfect straight line. Uh, this is with the help of uh, some special thrusters and special propulsion equipment, uh, which are GPS controlled so that the ship is not uh, moving left or right from the line, imaginary line, there's no road there on the sea. 
on the dimension line it goes absolutely straight okay sir thank you thank you is done automatically is it is done automatically is sorry it is done automatically uh, what is that? keeping line straight line it is done automatically or it is automated yes uh, it is it is told to go from this point to that point with an accuracy of so many uh, whatever is the equipment's accuracy on the straight line yep and then like the power cable ratings uh, this uh, fiber optic cable also having some ratings and all eh? fiber optic cable and power cable uh, what is the comparison you wanted sri no 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 not a comparison i mean the rating ratings no. uh, for example we say 220 gigabit of power cable so much like that no see all the power cables um, are going to be in my understanding dc cables mm -hmm. dc will be transmitted yeah and uh, like india is going to supply dc supply to saudi in oh, another yeah. two years time there already a project which is started on that tomorrow when you have windmills uh, which are going to generate uh, electricity it will be converted to dc uh, and uh, unless DC, if they are directly dc it will come by dc straight to uh, uh, receiving station uh, the losses will be minimum if it is dc supply uh -huh. you know what i mean uh, uh, like the power cable rating do we have rating for uh, this uh, fiber optic cable also i'm not understanding your question uh, so can you speak up more no no for power cable rating for power cable we have 220 kv 410 kv 60 kv cable rating and power uh, uh, transmitter and that's all loading uh, how much load can be loaded and all? No, I'm, 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 not, I'm not able to tell you. Such a I'm not able to tell you how much ampere uh, the power cable can carry. Uh, it depends on uh, obviously the voltage at which you are going to uh, yeah, transmit yeah. DC, right? Uh, yes. But uh, obviously, uh, large current will have to be carried. Therefore, the cross section will be very high. And therefore, the cable will be very bulky, and the cable will be very heavy, uh, and it has to be uh, sheet, uh, sheet and all uh, a lot of efforts are required in laying it. Oh. Uh, all this will happen. We don't have yeah. an example in our country where we have laid a uh, power cable uh, under the sea. There could be some power cables laid under water, uh, especially to, uh, uh, let us say, under some dams where uh, yeah, yeah crossing is possible yeah uh, long possible. span record for yeah it's possible yeah. in know optical fiber there will be some grading sir so single graded multi graded like grading optical fiber cables there will be single graded multi graded like uh, writing graded you said braided graded grade grading grading no uh, what uh, the fiber optic cables which are required for undersea cables are uh, required to be of the highest quality because uh, I, in fact somebody earlier asked what is the life the life of the cables are expected to be between 25 to 30 years they're designed for 25 to 30 years uh, but there are some cables as i told you the la first cable was laid so many years back sometime in early 90s uh, some have gone uh, defective but India's first cable, which was laid in '97, is still uh, running, still working. Anybody else? Hari? Yes, yes, but uh, um, I don't know what question I had asked. No, no, I just uh, wanted to. Uh, uh, anyway, since you called my name, I should ask something, you know. Yeah, yeah. Now, you have been telling no government owns the cable, yeah. right? It's all owned by the private agencies. That means uh, you also said it is a very, I mean, uh, as far as the internal intelligence is concerned, very uh, important for any country. So, which agencies are interested like this? Which are agencies? Because if uh, India does say similar, same, um, um, China will also engage the same people if possible. Yeah. So, is there, uh, there not a, so this is a very uh, good question, first of all. Uh, you have an industry here, it's actually a service, it's not an industry. 
uh, they are service providers. They provide these cables under the sea. So these service providers are normally uh, operating in a consortia and they, they fear, of course, that their cables can get damaged. And of course, if they get damaged, they'll repair it. But the loss is to the user because internet has got cut, the cable has got cut, its connectivity is lost till such time the cable is restored. So the amount of money lost by the users is much, much more than uh, the physical uh, repair cost uh, of the cable, number one. Number two, uh, it is important for these private industries which are in this consortium to have a high level of orientation towards the security uh, apparatus of the country, right? Where they are providing the service. It's important for them to uh, make sure that uh, they follow uh, whatever is required to be done. There's a government agency which will be advising them regarding any possible uh, any possible threat to their cable landing station, which is on land, which is which can be very well protected, and also any possible action which can happen uh, under the sea, it can. It's very much there. So is the case with power station. There are so many power stations uh, which are uh, run by private companies. They are also very very important. The power station cannot afford to be damaged or uh, you cannot have someone uh, tripping it to make sure that it is not able to restore back into service. So there is a need for such uh, industries which are in uh, providing essential services. Now, internet has almost become an essential service, even though I don't think it comes under Essential uh, Services Act as an essential service. So it is important that uh, these service providers are uh, uh, in dialogue with uh, the government to ensure that they follow uh, security norms. And as far as cable landing stations are concerned, there are many tiers of uh, protection. There's an outer ring, which is by the local uh, police. There's the inner ring, which is by some other security service. There's one more ring which is done by uh, a special security service. They're not of government arm necessarily. And only very uh, few people have access uh, to these cable landing stations where uh, the cables and the various equipment associated with internet connectivity is operated. Unfortunately, uh, much is not there in public domain on how these cable landing stations are uh, protected. That information is not available. Good question, though. It was not intended. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it, it is definitely a worry. I, I was under. I was nursing the how the security no, no. compromise. Hari, Hari you're right. It, you're right. It is a worry uh, for all of us that our internet connectivity can get damaged by somebody else if they want to do it. And it'll affect our quality of life, Hello. but also for the various uh, institutions, it'll affect them very Hello. seriously Hello. in their operations. Okay. Yeah, Sabu. There, are, there is a uh, process like this, uh, multi-mode and single mode. Uh, can you see, sir? Yeah. Uh, so this is, this is this is a grading, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, sometimes you can use single mode, single uh, laser source, or multi mode means multiple laser uh, source uh, using the same medium. So That's right. This can, this can be con considered as a grading. Uh, okay, what, uh, fine, fair enough. Uh, the, the, these are all standard techniques which are used uh, uh, in uh, different modes of operation of fiber optic cables. And uh, definitely it is uh, multi-mode, which is being used uh, for undersea cables as well. Yes. Okay, then uh, Roy, sir, please. 
Sir, the, the cost of the cable is bared by the uh, FP and other uh, Google, uh, Amazon, etc. But the um, uh, laying and uh, maintaining cost is done uh, by the government, isn't it, sir? No, 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 uh, no, no, no. Total, uh, Cables are bought by the owner, that is, let's say, Google. Yes. Laid by Google through a company, some shipping okay. company. Okay. Operated by Google. Everything the is uh, okay. The cable landing stations uh. are also run by another private company on behalf of Google. Okay. The government okay. gives only permission for the cable landing. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh. Uh, once again, cable problem. Currently, the problem on the. Reference and the program uh, twelfth in LA, sir. I'm ready. Okay, sir. One more, one more problem. Okay. So can we stop here, sir? Ah, oh, sure, sure. Okay. Okay, sure, 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 sir. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the class, mindful meditation day, a topic on Anthony Pukumbergil, sir. Uh, the Randamatha session on mindful at Angana Munota Pogam and the Lady. I have self uh, forgiveness in day, one more session on fourth session on. Uh, I didn't say one second current current little product on the outside of the so we also can stop. Hari uh, Hansar class of Pandana the eleven. Unity Kikanilla, Unity, Unity, Kalkanilla. Pandranda. Friday. Friday. Okay, okay. So, uh, where are you going to go? George, sir. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I can only the information Rathani is not an over our in Gambiro. Yes, and satellite applications satellite. I take a down eye point. Was the other popular at low GD and which I'm like putting the internet lamp over the other. I'm going to communication apart. I'm sure you can get a the room. Land a lap and a lamp, the server based out of communications a lamp land seabed. Do it in there. No, I'm going to travel like a poil. I'm going to travel like a poil. White color or ship out a launch. Ah, ah. Uh, 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 Alas, <laughs> Rana, I am the ship going to 
ാണ് <laughs> 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 നോയ്സ് കൂടും ഡിലേ വരും എപ്പോഴും ഫിസിക്കൽ കണക്ഷൻ ആണ് കൂടുതലും റിലയബിൾ ഈ ലാറ്റൻസി കാര്യങ്ങളൊക്കെ വരുന്നത് തന്നെ അല്ല ഈ ഒപ്റ്റിക്കൽ ഫൈബറിന്റെ ലോസ് വളരെ കമ്പാരിറ്റീവ് വളരെ കുറവാണ് വളരെ 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 കുറവാണ് അത് തന്നെയല്ല അതിന് ആംപ്ലിഫയറിന്റെ ആവശ്യമില്ല റിപ്പീറ്റേഴ്സ് മതി ജസ്റ്റ് ഡിജിറ്റൽ ആംപ്ലിഫിക്കേഷൻ അല്ല നടക്കുന്നത് ശരിക്കും റിപ്പീറ്റിംഗ് ആണ് ആ വോൾട്ടേജ് സൂപ്പിന്റെ ലെവലിന് ജസ്റ്റ് റിപ്പീറ്റ് ചെയ്ത് കൊടുക്കും ഇപ്പൊ സീറോ ഡിജിറ്റൽ കമ്മ്യൂണിക്കേഷൻ സെൻഡ് ചെയ്യുമ്പോഴും ആ പ്രോസസ് തന്നെയാണ് സീറോ വൺ ഈ രണ്ട് ലെവലേ ഉള്ളൂ വൺ എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് ഒരു ഫൈവ് വോൾട്ട് ലെവൽ ആയിരിക്കും ആ ഫൈവ് വോൾട്ട് ലെവലിലേക്ക് താഴെ പോയാൽ അടുത്ത ബൂസ്റ്റിംഗിൽ ഫൈവ് വോൾട്ട് ആക്കി കൊടുക്കും ഓട്ടോമാറ്റിക് ആയിട്ട് കണക്ഷൻ വളരെ സിമ്പിൾ ആണ് അതേസമയം അനലോഗ് കമ്മ്യൂണിക്കേഷൻ നമ്മള് ലൈൻ വഴി ഇലക്ട്രിക് ലൈൻ വഴിയുള്ള ലോസ് എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞാൽ അത് ഒരിക്കലും നമുക്ക് തിരിച്ചു പിടിക്കാൻ പറ്റത്തില്ല ദാറ്റ് വിൽ ലോസ് ഇറ്റ്സ് പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ഹീറ്റ് ആയിട്ട് അതുകൊണ്ട് ഒപ്റ്റിക്കൽ ഫൈബർ വളരെ പക്ഷെ എത്രയോ കാലം ഒപ്റ്റിക്കൽ ഫൈബർ കേബിൾ കണ്ടുപിടിച്ചിട്ടാണ് ഇത് ഇംപ്ലിമെന്റ് ചെയ്തത് ഏകദേശം ട്വന്റി ട്വന്റി ഫൈവ് ഇയേഴ്സ് സിസ്റ്റം ആ അത് അത് വെറുതെ നിന്നതിന് ശേഷമാണ് ആ ടെക്നോളജി തന്നെ യൂസ് ചെയ്യാൻ തുടങ്ങുന്നത് അങ്ങനെയാണ് അത് നോബൽ പ്രൈസ് കിട്ടിയത് നമ്മളൊരു സാധാരണ ഒരു ടെലിഫോൺ ലൈനിന്റെ എത്ര കപ്പാസിറ്റി പഴയ ടെലിഫോൺ എക്സ്ചേഞ്ചിലൊക്കെ ഫോർ ഹൺഡ്രഡ് ഫൈവ് ഹൺഡ്രഡ് കണക്ഷൻസ് ഒക്കെ കൊടുത്ത സ്ഥലത്ത് നമ്മൾ ഫൈബർ ഓപ്റ്റിക് വഴി എത്ര മില്യൺസ് ഓഫ് പീപ്പിൾ ആർ കമ്മ്യൂണിക്കേറ്റ് ഒരു ഒരു ജപ്പാൻകാരനാണ് കണ്ടുപിടിച്ചത് പക്ഷെ എത്ര ഇരുപതോ ഇരുപതോ വർഷത്തിൽ കൂടുതലായി അത് കണ്ടുപിടിച്ചതിന് ശേഷം ഇംപ്ലിമെന്റ് ചെയ്യാൻ തുടങ്ങി ആ ടെക്നോളജിയിലേക്ക് എത്താസ്റ്റിക് ചേഞ്ച് ആയിരുന്നു കമ്മ്യൂണിക്കേഷൻ ഇത് സ്പെഷ്യൽ ഡിവൈസ് ഒക്കെ വെച്ചാണ് അതിന്റെ ഇത് ചെയ്യുന്നത് ഇപ്പൊ പിന്നെ ഹൈഡ്രജൻ കൊളൈഡർ ഒക്കെ ഉപയോഗിച്ച് ഫോട്ടോൺസിന്റെ കോൺസെപ്റ്റിലുള്ളത് പക്ഷെ അതൊന്നും ഫൈനലായിട്ട് വരുന്നില്ല കോസ്റ്റ് ഇഫക്റ്റീവ് അല്ലല്ലോ ഭയങ്കര കോസ്റ്റ്ലി ആണ് അത് അത് വെച്ച് നോക്കുമ്പോൾ ഫിഫ്റ്റിക്കൽ ഫൈബർ ഒക്കെ വളരെ ചീപ്പ് ആയിട്ട് സിമ്പിൾ ലേ ചെയ്യാനാണെങ്കിലും ഒക്കെ വളരെ ചീപ്പാണ് ഈസിലി അവൈലബിൾ ആണ് സോ ഓക്കെ താങ്ക് യു സാറിനോട് നന്ദി പറയാൻ പറ്റില്ല Okay thank you thank you very much thank you once again nalathamukku mind fitness okay see you bye good night good night